Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible, and that together we can make it happen. I'm Amanda Scott, your host at this place on the web where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, all in the service of conscious evolution and, increasingly, in finding a way forward to a future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. My guest this week is a friend and a neighbour. Will Llewellyn is Director of Red Kite Management, which is an energy consultancy company that focuses on renewable methane. For all the time I've known him, Will has been a passionate advocate of the use of renewable methane as a way to fill the gap that is inevitable when we give up fossil fuels. It's not the only answer, but it's a significant part of the answer to how we're going to power our cars or heat our homes or create electricity when we no longer want to burn coal and oil and gas from Russia. And Will is one of those people who is working at the front end He knows so much. The depth and breadth of his knowledge is always breathtaking. And he's making it happen. He's going out there and he's installing the plants or buying up the trucks or creating the networks to change the world around us. And he has ideas for how we can take agency to change the world ourselves. So people of the podcast, please do welcome my friend and neighbour and a real hero of the renewable movement, Will Llewellyn of Red Kite Management. So, Will Llewellyn, Director of Red Kite Management, thank you so much for taking time off on this beautiful spring morning to come on to Accidental Gods. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Banda. How are you? And thanks for having me. You're welcome. I I have an eye now. I was down to one eye this time last week. It was extremely unpleasant, but I am back to having two eyes now. It's great. Um, Good. So, thank you. You are... A couple of villages away. There was a time when I first met you and we lived in adjacent villages and then we both moved in opposite directions. So now there's a couple of villages between us. But at the time when we met and ever since, you have always struck me as somebody who completely gets the climate and ecological emergency and is doing everything that you can in a practical level to make things different and to help other people make things different. And I'm wondering, how did you get into this? How did it become the defining feature of your life, if I'm right that it is? Well, nothing is ever straightforward. Um, And so I grew up in rural Herefordshire, um, and I had a workshop. And so ever since I was about 12, I was always making things, whether it was old cars or things that interested me. And um, in about two, about maybe 1999, I went to a festival that was called the Big Green Gathering, and I built a wind turbine that stood on a five-meter pole with a truck alternator um, that charged batteries, and so we could power our band using 12-volt truck battery through an inverter because there was no fossil fuel power allowed on that site. So that that switched me on to other ways of generating electricity or producing useful energy. I studied science at university. I was uh, I did biology and French at Manchester. And um, quite by accident, I was at a rave and I was talking to a guy about an interesting process that he'd come across in about 2008 that used the contents of animals' guts after they'd been slaughtered to turn into renewable electricity and renewable heat via methane. And I thought, my goodness, that sounds like anaerobic digestion because i'd studied that through university and you know it's just a part of science and um it sounded quite interesting and at the time i was working in the city of london working in the shipping business working for some ship owners who were carrying refined products including biofuels which i was very interested in and i thought well that's my ticket out of london because by that time in my life i had a one child i had no desire to spend the rest of my life sort of grinding away in London, running hard to stand still. And I thought I'd better find out more. And so I got my first job in AD in Ludlow in 2009, working for a company called Greenfinch Limited, where I was the assistant to the technology director, a guy called Michael Cheshire, and I effectively did the equivalent of an apprenticeship. Hmm. So using my rather diverse 
set of experiences uh, and skills from like deal making through to science to being able to drive a MIG welder through to um, being able to talk other languages to get things done. I started working in AD and since then I've been doing it ever since. And the common denominator in all the work that I do is renewable methane. And so whether that comes out of a biogas plant on a farm or a food waste digester or um, out of a landfill site, it's all the same molecule, CH4. It's all an extremely versatile energy vector. And there are applications where if you don't harness methane and you let it go into the atmosphere, like through uncovered slurry lagoons or uh, uncapped landfill sites, for example, it's a really potent greenhouse gas um, with a carbon intensity 34 times that of carbon dioxide. So while making a good source of versatile renewable energy, which is a drop-in replacement for compressed natural gas or a, a, a electricity for export into the grid, you're also preventing these fugitive methane emissions. And that's actually what it's all about. Wow. Okay, there is so much in there I want to unpick. Starting with, I had no idea you had a band. I've known you for a decade and a half, and you had a band back then. Do you want to tell us, have you still got a band? Uh, well, we, we're, still, we're still good friends and we play together. But um, sometimes the... You know, having gone from the powers of the the mighty organ, which was the name of the band, playing out probably twice a week when we all lived in London and didn't have children and life was easy, um, we, we we play a bit from time to time. But it's rather like sort of kicking a corpse. But you know, the the, the spirit's still there and it's good fun. But we're not as good as we were. All right, guys, go find the mighty organ, all listeners. That's that's your new new thing for this week. So we talked about the fact that methane is 34 times more potent than CO2. I'd like you to explain kind of how we get to that, because it seems to me that people often bandy around a lot of stats and we don't really know where we get them, particularly, I have to say, when it comes to farming and they talk utter nonsense about cattle producing huge quantities of methane when the the stats were derived from US feedlot cattle who are fed huge cereals exclusively and live on concrete and it's different when they aren't fed cereals and don't live on concrete but we'll get to that eventually but then let's have a look at methane what it is and how it can become part of the solution instead of part of the problem is that too big an idea or can we head into that no i think we'll we'll um let's grapple it and give it a start and stop me when you want me to elaborate um on any particular aspect i shall put my hand in the air yes go for it Right. So methane, it's a, it's a gas at room temperature. It has a chemical structure of CH4. So it's a, it's a hydrocarbon. Um, it can be liquefied at about minus 164, or it can be compressed to 250 bar for safe transportation and utilization. Or it can be recovered in a dilute form in a mixture of gases which is called biogas, which is produced by microorganisms. And then it can be used directly at lower concentrations to uh, run gas engines or to uh, power boilers to produce point sources of heat and electricity, which in some cases can be you know, very small. So some people will build uh, a small anaerobic digester or biogas plant. And you know, these are all over the developing world. So India, China, Africa, where they're they literally run on dung from their livestock, and well, there's very little food waste in those in those countries. But it's to provide gas to cook on, because one of the major causes of deforestation and desertification is actually people going out to look for wood to cook on. And so, the further they go from their village, the further they have to walk, the more they're you know the more the more they struggle. And then also the other the other problem of that is that um, where people are cooking over open fires, they get all sorts of respiratory and, uh, and eye diseases. So, you know, at a very small scale, biogas can produce enough clean cooking gas for one or two or three households. And then at the other end of the scale, um, a large anaerobic digestion plant might produce enough biomethane injected into the grid to heat 10,000 households, or it might produce enough gas to run a fleet of heavy lorries on the motorway network of any country, or it might produce enough electricity for... Uh, several thousand households depending on what the application of the biogas is so it's all the sa it's all the same core process but getting to the end result is subtly different depending on what the feedstocks are and depending on what the chosen application for the for the energy is so just on an empirical basis if it is the case that we could be running fleets of lorries with this mm -hmm. why are we not 
Is it a feedstock issue, a distribution issue, or is it just that the fossil fuel companies are, are sitting on people so that they can't? No, it's it's not as cynical as that, actually. Um, there has been an impasse within the uh, OEM, so the original equipment manufacturers, and the deployment of a of a refueling infrastructure for 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 all vehicles, actually. Uh, and so I think the best way to do this is to kind of give an example and to explain. Um, for, for reasons unknown to myself, being an avid Europhile, we happen to drive with the steering wheel on the right-hand side of our vehicle, where the rest of the world drives with their steering wheel on the left-hand side of their vehicle. Do you want to know why that is? I'd love to. We drive on the left-hand side because you hold a sword in your right hand and you needed to meet the oncoming guys with your sword. So from Roman times, if you were on a dual carriageway, you needed to stay on the left because most of us are right-handed. When Napoleon decided that his he wanted to do things differently to England, then he switched France. And because Napoleon switched, the rest of Europe switched, and America went the other way for exactly the same reason. And then everybody followed the majority, and we were left with our sword hands on our right. Anyway, there we go. Ah, okay. I know. I mean, that 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 explains it. And I mean, I think I like the context of a dual carriageway because sometimes when I'm driving down the A303, it feels a bit like a dual carriageway, but with an E rather than an A because of the way things go there. But um, but but in all seriousness, the 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 impasse is to do with the availability of vehicles. So compressed natural gas has been used since the. Well, I mean, the Italians Fiat were using it in the 1930s and then um there there's been a, a grown uh, a, a huge growth in infrastructure throughout europe led predominantly by germany finland and sweden um to uh develop a network of refueling stations and so that there was then you know there was a technological solution from the from the uh likes of volkswagen and mercedes and the big vehicle manufacturers um and they tried to deploy their gas vehicles into the UK market, but because of the fact that people drive on the on the other side of the road, it wasn't deemed to be economically attractive to them to produce small production runs of right-hand drive gas variants. And so what happened was there was effectively a chicken and egg scenario where the deployment of the refueling infrastructure was held back because there was a shortage of suitable right-hand drive vehicles and then when the right-hand drive vehicle lot were asked if they wanted to produce more right-hand drive vehicles they said no they didn't because there wasn't the refueling oh. infrastructure so so what was what was very interesting was i actually bought up my business red kite management bought up all of the right-hand drive Volkswagen, volkswagen caddy vans and Mercedes Sprinter vans, which were factory built gas variants. Wow. Because we trawled the second hand market. You know, they, they they were introduced from 2008. We bought them all up and we put them out on contract hire in London, where they were, uh, there was a, a, a refueling station just north of King's Cross where they could refuel these vehicles. So they're very low emissions. Wow. And it worked a treat. And so when I went to, Milton Keynes, which is the head office of Volkswagen corporate and the head office of Mercedes corporate, to ask them for a trifling 500 Volkswagen caddies. That was deemed to be not a big enough production run to be worthwhile putting it in right-hand drive. So that was the end of the sub three and a half ton vans going into gas um, because the focus has been on electrification, actually, of the smaller vehicles now. But when it comes to heavy trucks, it's a very different story because the only way to decarbonize the logistics supply chain is via biomethane because effectively hydrogen is a long way away. Okay. Uh, I think that, you know, there's, it seems to be the silver bullet. It's politically very attractive to talk about hydrogen, even if people don't really know what they're talking about from a policy perspective. And electrification is difficult on heavy trucks because your payload suffers because you've got, you're carrying so much battery that if your gross vehicle weight is 44 tons and you've got 38 tons of battery on board, so that's not enough room for, um, for, for cargo. So, Given that biomethane offers the cargo owners to the opportunity to to green up their supply chain, the market is being driven by the carbon reduction requirements of the cargo owners, uh, and they uh, and they're imposing that on their supply chain contractors, which is why we see the likes of uh, Stobart's or who else? Uh, John, John Lewis are running on gas. Uh, there's a there's a whole load of uh, there's a whole load of hauliers which are running on gas, and if you get into it, you look for gas tractor units they're quite easy to spot when you get into it but what that's driven is the growth of the uh biomethane 
refueling infrastructure built by private companies such as cng fuels because they know that they will get a they'll, they'll get a base load core business of contract offtake work from this let's say core uh, haulage and so they'll build open access refueling stations at strategically useful locations knowing that the base load will be met by whatever contracts they've got with whatever carriers and then People like me are involved in the secondhand truck market. So when trucks get sold after being five or seven years in a fleet, they'll, those gas trucks will get sold into the secondhand market. So I'll be able to find a buyer who will then be able to buy two or three trucks and then to fill them at all of the CNG fuels refueling infrastructure or gas wrecks or air liquids. And so what we've done is we've effectively broken this impasse. But the reason why the, the impasse is broken is it's been driven by the First of all, the technological development of getting biomethane into the gas network and into trucks and onto roads, and I, I can talk about that process in a minute, but also by the market-driven need to, uh, to, to, to decarbonize supply chains. Okay, so many different things there. Yes, so you said about things being a silver bullet, and I listened to somebody the other day saying there is no silver bullet, but there might be silver buckshot, and that this is, there's lots of little different things. So first question. If we can create a refueling infrastructure and if it's starting, is it the case that most of us would be better to take our existing cars and make them run on gas rather than heading for electric vehicles with all of the problems of rare earths? Is it is it that liquid gas is actually a better option? Is the feedstock there? Or would we end up, this is probably a slightly different route, but I, my concern fed by friends in Germany is that Germany ended up putting tens of thousands of hectares into monoculture growing of green stuff to feed reactors that otherwise would have been feeding people. And it was taking up huge amounts of land and water. Is that something that we would end up having to balance? Or are there ways of creating the feedstock that we could all be running our cars on biofuels and it would be better than electric vehicles? Well, I think that's, that's that's a very good question. So let's take it in. Let's take it step at a time. So there are a range of feedstocks which are good for the production of biogas and or biomethane. We'll take a few extremes because it's always worth taking extremes, and everything else tends to sit in the middle. So cow slurry, for example, um, your average high yielding dairy cow produces sixty eight liters per day of slurry. Cool, useful, very 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 useful point source of uh, of feedstock for a biogas plant. And let's say that the reality is of uh, intensive dairy production is that you might have a thousand of these cows in in a, a shed somewhere producing a lot of slurry. Okay, so we'll just uh, so that's. Um, I'll just work it out. 68,000. 68,000. <laughs> uh, 60, yeah, 68,000 litres per day of, um, of, uh, of, of dairy. So, That's a lot of slurry. Well, actually, I don't think it is that much. I'd call it 68 cubic metres, and it sounds a lot more manageable. I mean, 68 cubes, yeah, that's, 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 that's doable. That's two road tankers. A day. What, just hang on, Will. What happens to that? Because I hadn't really done that math in my head, and I've seen the slurry lagoons at the dairy farms. And I mean, this stuff is, this is part of the reason we have toxic oceans that are killing all the phytoplankton is that we just chuck it into the sea. What normally happens to this? Yeah. Okay. So um, there will, uh, slurry will be held in a tank um, and then it will be spread um, at particular times of the year, according to uh, what the ground conditions are and what the meteorological conditions are. Or for example, if there's a uh, NVZ, which is a nitrogen vulnerable zone, the slurry can't be spread at times where uh, it could be leached straight into water courses. And actually, by and large, um, most dairy farmers are very conscious of not spreading through NVZ closed periods because, you know, uh, they are. You, you have to remember that there is a a, a well run farm is a is a is a holistic relationship between land production and management. Okay, and 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 so. I think it's very easy to to see major problems in everything, but ultimately um, there is. I mean, I spoke at a conference at the University of Edinburgh a few years ago that was called sustainable sustainable intensification. Uh, bigger is not always bad, and and so what it what it was talking about was how if you have if you gather up all these point source, uh, let's say production of slurry, etc., then you then you can actually collect it and do something useful with it. So. Back to your question, what happens to the slurry? Very often it'll go into open lagoons and then it'll um, 
It'll gas a ton of slurry, produces about 20 cubic meters of biogas per day at 60% methane. And so that methane will go into the atmosphere, and that's called a fugitive methane emission. And that's not a good thing. Hmm. Okay. That slurry, if it was put into a biogas plant, which is a covered reactor, basically, with a heating system and a mixing system in it, to keep the mixture homogenous and to, you know, you heat it up to typically about 40 degrees in order to give the microbes the optimum temperature for for uh, met- metabolism to take place you know that's going to produce a fairly steady supply of uh, of biogas which you can do something useful with and so just using round numbers with our thousand cow dairy farm producing it 68 tons of slurry a day that'll produce about 56 cubic meters per hour of biogas wow Okay, so if you were to take that 56 cubic meters of biogas per hour, you could, if you were to turn that all into electricity, provide enough electricity for uh, about 250 typical households if you were to export that electricity to the grid. Or, and this is what really gets me going, you could produce the equivalent amount of vehicle fuel to about 450 liters of diesel per day. Wow. Wow. So that's pretty cool. That really is. Given that I, I read something about a year ago that every litre of diesel or other fuel that we burn has the warming potential to melt one tonne of Arctic ice. And given that the Arctic ice is currently falling into the oceans as we speak, saving 450 tonnes of Arctic ice every day would be a really good thing. You're also then not sending this fugitive methane into the sky. So there's going to be an even greater balance to be done with that. Mm. So... 250 households or 450 litres of diesel, or and that's just with one dairy farm. Yeah, that's with one dairy farm. Okay, and so the question is, why aren't we doing this everywhere? That was my question. Right, and so um, there, are two, there are two main reasons. One is it's about identifying the right farm because any successful anaerobic digestion project is a, is a three-point interdependency between a source of viable feedstock, an outlet for the energy that you're going to produce, and then uh, a land bank to spread the digestate. Now, the digestate application is extremely important. Most people forget about digestate, um, and generally people will only think of digestate for the wrong reasons. Anaerobic digestion is is a natural biological process whereby sugars and proteins, fats, are converted into biogas, which is carbon dioxide and methane and then there's the residual npk and whatever else is left in the soup which is not you know but methane is ch4 uh but carbon dioxide is co2 you know there's no np and k in any of that gas there might be a little yeah, bit so of all of the mineral content is is like an ash then it's right yeah but it's a it's a, it's a slurry typically it's at about seven percent dry matter so it can be carried in a tanker and it can be applied to land and it's extremely useful bio uh, biofertilizer so what does that mean for the big picture it means that there's a uh, there's a, a, a reduced dependency on um inorganic imported fertilizers as a reduced dependency on imported phosphates Phosphates are a finite resource. No one talks about phosphates, but they are. But we're already exceeding the planetary boundaries of nitrogen and phosphates. That's one of the one of the the nine boundaries that the Stockholm system sure. produced. So we've got to we've got to stop spreading it as much. Part of the regenerative farming is to get wean people off needing to spread stuff by having plants that actually send their roots down and take it up from the soil. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. But the, but but if you um if you look at I'm I'm no I'm no expert agronomist, but I I know that the amount of organic material that you spread back into the land, i.e. the amount of carbon that you can sequester back into the soil through yes, um true. through through the application of digestase. Okay. It means that you've got a so you've got a nutrient cycling. So if you're imagine you're growing crops to feed into cows which you're then anaerobically digesting the the, the cow slurry, okay. the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphate goes back into the same soil. So you don't have to import. Okay, so you've got a cycle. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So um, so uh, where were we? Oh, yeah, so that's the, that's the digestate. And it's really important because most biogas plants work on what's called a continually stirred tank reactor basis. So you, you have a tank which has got, let's say, 1,800 cubic meter working volume. Okay, uh, it's got, the, the contents are kept at 38 degrees and they're mixed and you know so there's no stratification in there it's bubbling away the way the way that the process works is you you feed in material at a, at a flow rate 
um, which is calculated against the discharge rate to if you have a, a bell-shaped distribu- a Gaussian distribution curve, you're aiming to have the maximum amount of particles in that tank for the maximum amount of time because each different feedstock has a different what's called hydraulic retention time, which is the amount of time it takes to yield its biogas under particular temperature conditions. So, for example, slurry, it'll produce its 20 cubic meters per fresh ton. You don't want to you don't want to keep it in a tank any more than about uh, for for any more than about twenty five days because by that point it will have yielded all its gas. Whereas a forage crop like maize, for example, you want to design for a sixty day retention time. Okay. So you see, um, it, it's it's actually it's a relatively straightforward process. Um, and so that's the feedstock element. Okay, is the feedstock suitable for the plant? If we're going to take the example of the slurry plant, we're going to say yes, it is. It's fine. We can pump that. It's good. It's good and thick. It's not too watery. The digestate has to be understood from a chemical and environmental perspective but if you can't get the digestate away from the plant you're not going to be able to feed any fresh material in so i have a very quick intervention question on there which is if we're trying to create circularity Mm -hmm. let's assume that our plant is producing our 450 liters of diesel equivalent yeah how much is that 450 liters diesel equivalent is required first of all to power power the plant and second to remove the digestate a distance formula that we can't do but let's assume it's not going more than 20 miles because there's another dairy farm more than 20 miles away so we're losing a certain amount of what we take out Mm -hmm. in the spreading of digestive has anybody kind of run those numbers through to see what the actual net positive yeah well this this is all this is all part of the design process when i was talking about how suitable are the projects for the you know for how how suitable is the, the application of the technology yeah these are all things that you look at so you know, there's there's a good old cliche. Don't lump it, pump it. If you if you can pump digestate around a uh, like an irrigation distribution circuit around the land, um, that means that you're not hauling digestate on the road. And it's quite you know, if it's seven percent dry matter, it's ninety three percent water. So you know, that's so a, it weighs a kilogram per liter, and it's heavy stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. But okay, but then you go and you know, I, I do a lot of work with New Holland, who have got a tractor that runs exclusively on on biomethane, their gas tractor. Okay. Right. And so if you were to use a New Holland gas tractor to haul your digestate, then you've got a carbon negative feedstock employed in the production of your energy process. So that's good. And then there are other kind of parasitic energy requirements, such as heating and uh, electricity to run pumps and mixers and that kind of thing. So because slurry is quite wet, it has a high specific heat capacity. So it does require, you know, it might require 10, 15% of the overall energy production in the parasitic heat requirement of that material but it doesn't require any mechanical pre-processing and maceration because the cows have already done a pretty good job of macerating it so you don't need a heavy duty front end to pre-treat it before it gets into the tank so you could say that depending on the scale of the plant you might be using 15 percent of your gross energy production to run it okay but that's still an 85 percent net energy use. Yeah, that's correct. So we live in a world where at the time of recording last week, our government decided to sell our national grid to an Australian asset stripping company. I'm assuming so that when the power goes down, they can pretend it's got nothing to do with them. It's all the market deciding that rural areas didn't really need power or they just triple the prices. Let's assume that we managed to rest that back. And if necessary, we do it with a revolution first. It seems to me that what we're looking at is weaning ourselves off big central power production and onto a distributed network of local production and local microgrids where our dairy farm combines with a hydro unit and solar panels and things. And that the dairy farms or or the anaerobic digesters, whatever the feedstock is, could be providing the base load that everybody says is the difficult thing with renewables because they all depend on the sun shining and the wind blowing. Am I right? Or is that just me being fantastical? No, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So, so what we're, what we're looking at is the, the, the smart grid concept. Okay. Now the smart grid concept has been around for a, a long time and it's been something that's been facilitated by technology. And so we put 
solar panels and ad is called distributed microgeneration okay so it's 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 a diffuse it's a diffuse uh, uh, small points of 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 microgeneration going into a network um in terms of base load you're absolutely right there's 8760 hours in the year okay um when you do the financial modeling on a anaerobic digestion facility typically you calculate that thing running at 90% of flat out for the whole time which is about just under 8000 hours per year okay so for example if i had a 500 kilowatt anaerobic digestion facility i'd expect it to be running at 90% of a minimum of 90% of that 500 kilowatts 247365 if i had a 5 kilowatt photovoltaic array on my roof i would probably if i was lucky i might get 20 percent of that what about wind L- local wind right as opposed to big wind wind i think it's 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 similar i mean i was uh, at a show in 2010 called energy now at the three county showgrounds and it was when ad was really kind of it was great we were kind of giving presentations back then about what is anaerobic digestion you know it's it very kind of big picture stuff but someone had set up a wind turbine outside the show and uh, there was a a speaker from DEC, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, who was on stage and he was talking about how wind power, onshore wind power was going to revolutionize everything. And I, I, I stopped him and asked him how that could be the case when the windmill that was set up outside the show wasn't turning quite yet. Um, and, and so wh- where, where I'm going with this is back to our portfolio of te- renewable technologies. There is no, well, no, no one silver bullet. So AD will provide the base loads. That's granted when it's generating electricity but what i think is more likely to happen is the bulk of anaerobic digestion facilities that are i would say small and on farm were built between about 2010 and 2016 was there a grant is that why that happened yeah yeah they, they, they were but they were built to match a particular feed-in tariff okay which is paid against the gross amount of electricity you generate and then you get a power sale price on top of that now that feed-in tariff ended for for or, or became commercially unviable for small projects. And bear in mind, in different parts of the country, there are different scales of agricultural operations. So we live in the West here, um, and typically there are mixed farms, which are which are much smaller than the sort of arable plains of East Anglia. Okay, so the the, the smaller the smaller sort of base load type producing plants which are built, you know, they they haven't. There are there are substantial amounts of them through the country, but there aren't any new ones being built, and it's highly unlikely that power generation from biogas will be re-supported after the current feed-in tariff expires. And the reason why is why? Well, no, it's it's very obvious actually. Um, it's because generating electricity from methane is a waste of good methane because of the electrical conversion efficiency of an engine. Okay. So, thirty-five percent of the useful energy in the methane will be converted into electricity through a power generation through inefficiency yeah but how much is it from coal or oil or or the gas that we're burning anyway oh no no you've got to let me get to the point this is a okay, compl- it's, a, it's quite a it's a, quite a complex sort of thing to, to grasp so imagine there's a loss of efficiency you know that that energy you've got 65 oh, percent is if you're not capturing the heat and using it usefully Okay, which a lot of plants do, but there are some that don't, then you've only got 35% of the energy in your gas is being used for something useful. Where the technology has moved on and back to the microgrid thing is it's about energy production and storage. Okay, so if you can have a photovoltaic array that is on your shed roof or on your roof, and that is also charging a couple of batteries, Okay, when the sun's not shining, the batteries are connected to your inverter and they're downloading into your inverter, which is stepping up the power to 240 volts and is effectively powering your house. And then I wish. Well, I've just bought I've just bought one of these arrays. Okay, well, you and I need to talk offline about that because ours doesn't do that. But anyway, yes, let's go. But I was very particular about getting one of those because I think energy storage is the is the is the answer. And the reason why I'm talking about this in this way is because yeah, you've got the microgrid distributed en- en- energy generation and the the base load from anaerobic digestion is great because of its 8000 operating hours in the year at flat out, but if other renewables can effectively contribute to energy storage and then the ge- the instantaneous generation plus the stored generation will then contribute more to that base load then rather than burning the biogas in an engine that's not very efficient you could upgrade it and turn it into vehicle fuel 
then that's a much better use of the biomethane because you're directly replacing diesel and petrol. What's the loss in the upgrade? You said upgrade it. How much power does that take? Oh, uh, well, you probably get about 1% methane slip. Did you say methane slip? 1% loss then? So it's a 99% efficient pr- production process. Yeah, well, about, about 99% re- methane recovery through the process. Okay. All right. And then we can stop this rush to electric vehicles, which is creating a dearth of rath- rare earths. John Whiteleg, who lives in Shrewsbury near us, who's one of the most switched on transport people I've ever met, said there isn't enough cobalt in the entire planet to even replace the UK fleet, never mind the world fleet with electric vehicles. So why are we doing this? But if we could use the vehicles that we've got and the designs that we've got and just put methane into the tanks instead of diesel, then we're on. Does it require, so this is presumably liquefied methane. Does it have to be under pressure? Do you have to really redesign the whole tank system and the delivery system? Yes, you do. So methane or or compressed natural gas is, is stored at, for cars and small vans at 200 bar and for bigger trucks and buses at 250 bar. So that's wow. you know, that's a substantial pressure. Um, if you think that a typical car tire is at 1.2 bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember from my anaesthetist days, we used to store oxygen at 60 bar and you did not want to be near a cylinder if it blew. So 200 bar, you don't want to be near your car if it blows, but presumably there's there's reasonable safety constraints that people know about to make sure that you're not just driving around in a bomb. Uh, well, well, of course. I mean, I, I would, I would sooner be driving in a gas vehicle than a petrol vehicle if there was an accident, because methane is lighter than air, goes up into the air. Um, whereas if you've got your petrol tank ruptures and you've got a pool of petrol around your vehicle, that's far more frightening prospect to to, to be in. Okay. And um, and you know, there's very strict rules and regulations concerning the the, the storage and the infrastructure to to manage compressed gases in vehicles. So. Yeah, I, I think that what we what we have to look at is, do we use the existing cars that we've got and retrofit them? Well, uh, retrofitting is always a little bit, it's a little bit difficult because there are some very, very good retrofit kits in the market. Um, but there is an element of you've got a vehicle that's made by number one, um, which has got its own engine management system, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got some aftermarket equipment, even if it's very good, that can it dovetail into the sophisticated engine management software of the OEM vehicle? Probably not. So you're going to be running at a slight compromise. And this is really, this is extremely important because the truck market um, looked at dual fuel retrofit for diesel and gas. And what happened with dual fuel kits was there was actually a substantial volume of methane that was not being burnt in the engines and coming out of the exhausts because of this. Oh no, disaster. And which is why all gas trucks now which are being used are are all dedicated gas engines okay they don't slip any methane so what's the best thing to do for the transport solution i'll be honest i don't really know i mean my my policy is to have well-maintained old diesel cars because they just work extremely well and living in rural areas i mean what you didn't mention is the what's the weight on the electricity grid going to be to charge up all this supposed electric cars when if you want to have a decent fast charger, you need a three-phase electric supply with a cable about as thick as your arm. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, 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 I really don't know what the answer is. But within the agricultural context and with the community transport context and with kind of back-to-base fleets, if there's a source of, a point source of uh, biomethane on a farm, for example, then, you know, that's great. Make sure it gets used locally. But there's also the opportunity to inject biomethane into the gas network at somewhere else let's say in lincolnshire and then that biomethane goes into the gas network and then if one has a filling station that's connected to the gas main in ludlow for example um and a contract is signed well you know there's a deal done between the producer who's injecting energy into the grid at site a and someone who's taking energy out of the grid at site b and the deal effectively says right you inject 100 megawatt hours at your site and will take out 100 megawatt hours of energy, then while the molecule is not the same as was injected as being taken out, it's the energy that counts. And that's called a mass balance. Okay. And that mass, that mass balance uh, application of biomethane injection and, and taking it out somewhere else is, is the whole driver for this deployment of CNG biomethane refueling infrastructure. 
So hang on a minute. I'm. Are we still talking fueling cars, or are now we now talking a gas network for for heating houses? Because I'm guessing it's different. This is for fueling vehicles, okay. but it's it's exactly the same principle as for um as for heating houses. But there's a gas network. There's a kind of gas grid. Yeah, correct. That, that covers the whole country. Whereas for fuel, is it is there a, a grid, or is it a, there's a huge tank at the filling station, and a truck comes up and dips pumps it in so I, I would recommend your listeners go and have a look at cngfuels.com i will put it in the show notes yeah to just to just to have a look they've got some good pictures they run a very uh efficient network of cng stations or biomethane stations i should say but no so so it works like this Amanda. there is a network of gas distribution pipe work that covers the whole country if you want to build a refueling station you connect to that so you have a compressor that sucks gas out of that gas network and then it compresses it to usually to 300 bar actually and stores it in racks of high pressure storage cylinders and then the vehicle comes up to a dispenser which is just like a diesel pump plugs in its nozzle onto its special nipple that's on the side which is called a receptacle um presses the go button and then the 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 dispenser manages the flow of gas into the vehicle until the vehicle reaches 200 or 250 bar and then on it goes i mean it's 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 really straightforward and thank you and i found cng fuels and i will i will stick it into the show notes thank you so that we can see it okay so just for my own interest we're back to it as i understand it it's more efficient to be using biogas methane mm -hmm. for for fuels if we still want to power houses mm -hmm. what's our base load is, is boris johnson right that's a a sentence that doesn't sit well in my mouth with the idea that we need 50 new nuclear power stations urgently to provide the base load because that does seem to be the issue with renewables unless we've got a lot of batteries which are going to hit the same rare earth issues unless the seawater batteries have come on a lot in the last few months that i didn't know about how are we going to create electrical base load for people is that or is this beyond your your remit it's yeah, I think, I think that 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 is that is beyond my remit. Um, I just don't know. Um, I think that one thing which politicians are very bad at doing is telling people to use less energy, and I, and that is one of the first things that I say. I mean, if uh, you asked about how can people be given agency over climate change, the way they can be given agency over climate change is being told to turn their thermostat down by five degrees and wear a sweater if it's cold. Yeah, I know. And and yes, people are doing that. But I'm also listening to people who, because of the fuel price rises, uh, I was listening to an old couple yesterday, they, they haven't turned their heating on for weeks. And she says, um, we're wearing, they're, they're in, both in their 80s, they're wearing every item of clothing they've got, even in bed. The air is still crisp and, and white mm. when they breathe out. I, I think... I think there's a limit to how much we can tell people to do that. And it would be nice to be able to provide these people with heating that they could afford that wasn't crippling the planet. So so the the other the other way that people can have agency over this is we would we were talking about feedstocks and I told you that I was going to talk about extremes. And so we went we 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 went we talked about slurry, which has twenty cubic meters per ton by well, twenty cubic meters. Yeah, and then we must have human well, slurry. Well I I think that, you know, human slurry is great if you are living in a place connected to main strains. London. Any city. Yeah, a city, exactly. So so if you look at the likes of Wessex Water, um, they've got a renewable energy production branch called Genico, G-E-N-E-C-O, um, where on any sewage treatment plant, the sewage sludge, which is the solid matter, which I, I'm going to use as the faecal material, is digested anaerobically to yield biogas, sewage gas, which is used, it, to, traditionally it was used just to heat the... Um, heat the digesters. Uh, then it was used in com combined heat and power units, which are gas engines with heat recovery on the exhaust and the oil on the charge air at the intercooler to produce electricity to run the plants um, and whatever uh, spare would go into the grid plus heat. But more recently, um, they are uh, using this sewage sludge to produce biomethane for injection into the grid. So Genico do this, um, where they co-digest sewage sludge and food waste. And Seven Trent do it at Minworth, which is an enormous sewage treatment plant near Coles Hill that's just southeast of Birmingham, where they, they are flowing substantial volumes of biomethane into the grid. What I was really about to talk about in the context of agency is food waste. 
because food waste is an excellent source of uh, biogas feedstock. And food waste, I think, is the least acceptable part of the modern just-in-time consumer culture. Um, and I don't like general statistics, but I've been to food waste digestion facilities and I've seen the material that comes in and you could eat it all. It's the well, you could eat probably 60% of it. So is this a supermarket deciding that the three tons of cabbages are a day out of, of their sell by date, so we have to throw yeah. them all away in spite of the fact they've been wrapped in plastic individually? Yeah, that's correct. So I went into an anaerobic digester that was taking food waste from a major supermarket chain. I won't say which one it was. About 10 years ago, I saw a rainbow trout in a box with the sell by date was the day after I was there. And I was just, uh, well, it nearly made me cry, actually. It was a disgrace. Um, and then a curtain side, a Arctic lorry backed into this reception hall and the sides went back and it was full of pallets of canned tomatoes. Now, I think canned tomatoes are things that you're advised to put in a nuclear fallout shelter to last you for years and years and years. So this was the, you know, this was sell-by dates. And, and how much use are canned tomatoes for... A biogas generator? You have to crush them? Oh, and I, do, well, I mean, you know, they'll, they'll make reasonable amounts of gas. But how, how do you, you have to individually get them out of the cans or do you just put them in a great big crusher and smash them and then put all the cans into it? No, this, this, is, this, is the great, this is the great black art of what's called depackaging machinery oh, um, to separate the, the packaging and the inerts from the feedstock. And, and actually, it's, 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 it's really extraordinary, the, the technology that's used to do that. But surely somebody somewhere on the line going this shouldn't be happening <laughs> needs to cut that cycle before the pallets of tin tomatoes end up being crushed and opened and think of the waste of energy and resources and everything so 30 percent of all food produced is thrown away at some point during the but during its its cycle whether that's out of grade straight on the field or through to stuff that's been chucked out because the sell by date's gone you know it's a disgrace and so ultimately the main the best thing to do is to reduce food waste okay and i think that that could be done by uh you know you have high high profile people like hugh friendly whittingstall was in was uh you know advocating people being less fussy about how bumpy a courgette was or something like that i mean it's completely absurd that people believe that the taste is going to be affected by whether it's a little bit lumpier than the next one, whatever. But um, ultimately it's there. And so while I absolutely think it's laudable, the, 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 the attempts people are making to reduce food waste on a sort of individual and a corporate level, where there is food waste, it's extremely important that if people want to have agency over it, they, they take their source separation seriously in order to produce clean streams of food waste that will be collected and they are collected actually in lots of big cities from the little food caddy i would say virtually all of that goes to anaerobic digestion i thought it went to making compost or is the compost after the digestion no the co composting was the was used to be the preferred route to dispose of organics because it effectively composting stabilizes the uh, the the organics uh, but produces oh well, it's aerobic so it produces carbon dioxide and doesn't yield any energy whereas if you anaerobically digest the food waste you get methane which is a great energy uh, an, an energy vector um and you get the you get the biofertilizer which goes back to land so that you're effectively nutrient recycling back to the farms and so there was a really great experiment that was done in ludlow um that was commissioned in 2008 where there was a 220 kilowatt food waste digester that was built on the uh on the industrial estate just inside the a49 where it was it was designed to run on food waste from Ludlow, Church, Stretton, um, a little bit into Mid Wales, and uh, it, it, it was the perfect sort of prototype for a small to medium scale community integrated food waste plant. And so, if we talk in kind of how, how it used to work, there was a couple of little collection vehicles that would go around um, and they would pick up food waste caddies. There was extremely good community uh, engagement. I mean, if you go to Ludlow, you'll still see window stickers that say "We support the Ludlow Biodigester." Um, there was an electric milk float that used to get charged up on the electricity and would go around the kind of the, the small streets collecting food waste. And it, and it worked extremely well until the South Shropshire District Council basically dissolved because Shropshire became unitized. And then the food waste collection contract was let to a private third party, which meant that for reasons that I don't fully understand, the food waste collection around the locality stopped being done because the food waste was then diverted somewhere else, which meant that this little AD plant 
which was designed to serve a community would no longer had its kind of modus operandi. Um, and, and what was, what was a real pity about that was at the time it was pioneering because it, it, it demonstrated that you could run a biogas plant just on food waste. It also had really good community engagement. So people were very proud of the fact that their food waste was going to something useful. It also supplied digestate to uh, a group of farms within about a 10 mile radius. So the, the amount of, ton miles of digestate was kept to a minimum and now you know if that plant was still going um again using round numbers if it was uh it had a 220 kilowatt chp on it which would have pulled about 110 cubic meters an hour of biogas so that would have made about 600 liters of diesel equivalent per day if we were running that through an upgrader to produce biomethane, which could quite happily look after a major chunk of either municipal vehicle movements around Ludlow or or, or some kind of community transport scheme. So th- those are the questions that I think if people want agency over yeah. how can they do something useful and they, you know, and for reasons we've discussed, they, they haven't got room for solar panels or the, the capital investment or whatever, it's to lobby their MP um, f- for some sensible use of their food waste which shouldn't be considered to be a waste it should be considered to be a valuable resource brilliant okay i'm aware that we're over the time we said we would be and i could talk to you for several more hours about this because it feels like you know so much and there is so much in this that's really really valuable but i think leaving people with something that they can do and the understanding that methane used right is not bad. We've all got this kind of idea that methane is toxic and fugitive methane clearly is, but that used right and used by people who know what they're doing, and there are people who know what they're doing, it's part of the overall solution. So we'll leave people with lobby your MP, see if you can get local food waste to be a thing, see if you can get local energy production to be a thing, see if you can get them to buy back the national grid because selling it off is functionally insane. I said that, not will. Is there any other one thing that people could do that would be useful? What would people do with their cars other than use them less from now if they want to stop using fossil fuels? I think think to use them less and to to really think about where they're going and what they're doing. um, I think that's that's the best way to do it. And I speak I speak as someone who has lived. I grew up in the countryside. I lived in London um, before I came back uh, and I was an avid user of my bicycle and public transport. But the reality is of rural life is there is a pitiful form of public transport and it is to, you know, again, lobby the MP for improved public transport links, but, you know, just use your cars as frugally as possible. Brilliant. Okay, we'll go with that. So Will Llewellyn, for Els and Y of Red Kite Management, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your enthusiasm and just for a ray of light, I think. It feels like things are surmountable if we actually all got our heads around the ways that they could be surmounted. So thank you so much for coming on to the Accidental Gods podcast. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Amanda. That's great. Thanks for having me. And that's it for another week. Enormous thanks to Will for the passion and enthusiasm and depth of his knowledge and for his practical action, getting out there in the world and changing things. So if all that you do is write to your MP and enthuse about anaerobic digestion and the use of local food waste, then that's a good thing. But you can also look at setting up things in your local area. We absolutely need to be generating our own heat and power and creating fuel for our cars. As ever with these podcasts, the conversation continues when we switch off. And so, if I've got this right, one tonne of food waste will produce enough biogas to propel a two-litre vehicle a thousand kilometres. And there are, potentially, 15.15 million tonnes of food waste in the UK per year. So that, if I get my arithmetic right, is 15 billion miles driven. Now, having looked up the summary statistics of our government, we currently drive around 280 billion miles per year. So 15 billion isn't going to wipe that out, but it's going to make a significant chunk in what we can do. 
And I'm not suggesting that you rush out and get your car to run on biofuel because if nothing else, the problem is going to be how to fill it. But talk to people. Get people aware of what's happening. Find out if there's anaerobic digestion plants in your area. A lot of farms are running them. So it may be that there are ways you can do that. Can you convert your local area of town, your local area of village, to some kind of anaerobic digestion use? Human slurry is a source of power instead of a way of completely contaminating our rivers, as our local water company did. And for the sake of brevity, and because you've heard it all before, I have just deleted the quite long rant about our government conducting a fire sale of all our remaining assets. I will say I genuinely have no idea why selling our national grid to an asset stripping company was a good idea. If anybody out there thinks they know the answer to that, please do let me know. Otherwise, your mission for this week is to write to your MP and your local council and anybody else that you think will listen and see if you can begin the move towards a more regenerative power production system in your area, wherever you are in the world. And we will be back next week with another conversation. In the meantime, enormous thanks to Cara C for the sound production and the music at the head and foot, to Faith Tilleray for the website and the conversations that sustain us, to Anne Thomas for the transcripts, and, as ever, to you for listening. If you know of anybody else who would be really inspired by the ways that we can generate power, please do send them this link. And that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.